Basically, it will be about how LLMs, large language models, support both attackers and defenders in the context of these supply chain attacks. Um, to motivate this a little bit, uh, probably many have many of you have heard about the increase of supply chain attacks in the last couple of years. So this is a, a trend since around about 2018, 2019. And we see in the meantime, uh, thousands and thousands of malicious packages, open source packages being deployed on public package registries like PyPI or NPM or Reboot Jams and so forth. Large campaigns have hundreds or even thousands of malicious packages. One of the bigger campaigns, for example, was uh, the Red Lily campaign, which I think comprised over 1,500 malicious packages for NPM. The attacker kind of generated NPM accounts in an automated fashion and used those um, automatically created accounts for deploying variations of the same malware over and over again many, many times. We also know there are dozens of known actively exploited attack vectors, examples being hijacking the accounts of legitimate, legitimate maintainers, submitting malicious pull requests, or name confusion attacks like typo squatting, or dependency confusion attacks, which was an attack found in 2021. What is important to understand, um, the takeaway, is that the majority of the supply chain attacks that we observe these days um, use these techniques name confusion, for example, typo squatting, combo squatting, or brand checking, and dependency confusion. So for example, the Backstabbers Knife Collection, which is a pretty unique data set of malicious packages, so really the tar balls that were used by the attackers, out of the 4,000 plus packages that are part of this data set, only a handful of packages were attacks on legitimate projects, and all the rest were really name confusion and dependency confusion attacks. Again, maybe a quick explanation. Name confusion is if attackers create new malicious packages from scratch in package registries, and they choose a name that is kind of similar to existing legitimate packages, and they just hope that developers fall victim, download those packages instead of the legitimate ones and execute the payload. Dependency confusion attacks are cases where um, companies or organizations have private internal packages, and uh, attackers happen to learn about the presence of these internal packages, and they uh, deploy packages of the same name on public registries and due to vulnerabilities in the dependency resolution process, the malicious publicly available package is preferred over the legitimate internal and private package of that organization. When it comes to detection, um, there are a few well-established techniques. They, those techniques have been used for years and years also on classical mal malware, um, classical viruses and so forth. And they are now also applied, applied to malicious open source packages. And I would like to quickly go over some of the main or important characteristics here. So static detection uh, basically looks at the source code or the binary code or different other representations of code, such as data flows or syntax trees, and tries to either find signatures of known malware or apply different heuristics or patterns in order to detect um, kind of suspicious behavior in those code representations, right? So for example, you can look at a piece of code and understand there is a URL request, an HTTP request being made, and then the response of that HTTP request is being fed into some dynamic eval statement, evaluation statement. Advantages are that uh, static de techniques are typically fast, but they struggle with detecting novel malware and obfuscation techniques. So sometimes it can be sufficient to just obfuscate or pack malware in a different way in order to trick those heuristics or patterns. The second problem is that very often um, 
benign packages, legitimate packages also expose behavior or exhibit behavior that can be caught by these heuristics and that would be false positives. Another uh, common technique is dynamic detection that typically comprises the execution of malware candidates in some sandbox environment and the observation of uh, system calls in order to understand whether there are maybe network calls to sus sus suspicious domain being made or whether there are file system accesses out of the intended legitimate directories. The advantage is that they are very independent of obfuscation and packing techniques that we have seen static approaches struggle with. Um, but they are prone to false negatives when it comes to triggering the malicious payload. Because in order to detect whether something is malicious, the malicious code has to be executed. But there can be certain guards or conditions um, or other evasion techniques used by attackers to prevent uh, the execution of the malicious behavior. And so if there's no malicious code executed, there's nothing malicious that can be observed in this dynamic fashion. So typically, um, it, is ex it is, for example, an easy evasion technique is just to wait a few minutes, uh, sleep for a few minutes before malicious code is executed. And this is already uh, basically uh, very difficult if you consider that um, dynamic detection has in some cases to detect to look at thousands and thousands and thousands of packages so they can rarely afford or hardly afford to wait five or ten or fifteen minutes for each package to wait until whether thing whether anything suspicious is happening another evasion technique is to search for the presence of indicators that the malicious code or the code is run in virtual machine environments and so forth in which case uh, attackers then abstain from executing it. And then uh, another um, other approach are machine learning or AI technologies. In the context of um, open source supply chain attacks, they commonly um, consist of extracting certain interesting features from either the metadata of the open source package or the code. Example metadata could be kind of the number of releases of an open source package, when the first when the package was explored um, published for the first time, whether there is a GitHub repository linked and so forth, and then code features or features extracted from code could be certain interesting API calls, such as invoking, uh, opening sockets, making network connections, or again writing or reading from the file system. And those features are then used in either sub supervised or unsupervised fashion using the Backstabbers knife collection, this data set of known malicious packages, for example, you could train a model with this labeled data set in order to then let the model predict or classify whether a given new sample is malicious or benign. Unsupervised ex or examples for unsupervised um, uh, learning uh, are, for example, clustering, and I've put and included two interesting references. And, and so here, basically, rather than depending on labeled data set, you let the uh, um, you use machine learning in order to detect structures or patterns. And uh, the references I put, the first one is trying to uh, is using clustering in order to see whether um, there are malware, whether there are single packages that are part of malware campaigns, but they are still on the respective registry. In this case, uh, being part of a cluster means that the code structure, the malicious code structure is similar to other um, campaign uh, packages, but they are still out there and existing. This is one way. And the other reference I put here used clustering in order to identify anomalous outliers that expose um, yeah, anomalous behavior uh, and therefore are um, candidates for malware. An easy example for a static example, very simplistic, but uh, also realistic. I've included a snippet that was part of one malicious open source package. What it does is it basically makes uh, 
a request to a tiny URL. Um, so a URL reads the response of the HTTP requests and pipes this or uses this in an exec statement, which basically means that there's some Python code loaded from a, a remote server and executed on the fly in, in that package. So this is very typical for the um, yeah, malicious packages that are found these days. How would you write a simple, simplistic static rule? This is one, one such example. It is used uh, using um, a data flow analysis, which is able to, and I hope you can see my mouse pointer, which is able to understand whether data flows from a source, in, which is identified by request URL open, to a critical sync, which is identified by this exec function call. And so this is <clears throat> a very simplistic uh, rule, which works and results in uh, yeah, bringing this finding up, right? So here, this dropper-like behavior is detected. Now, the problem is with static detection, again, as I mentioned, as soon as attackers start to change the structure, obfuscate it in one way or another, static detection may have problems. And this is what we observe in, uh, in recent malicious packages. More and more, we see that rather than having just this tiny little slip it, snippet, they start uh, distributing those uh, different function invocations to different, um, to different functions within the same file, or to different files, or to different packages altogether which makes that static rules, which just look at a limited context of a single function using um, intra-procedural data flow um, analysis, as in this case, struggle to find such cases. All right, and, um, and so with the advent of uh, ChatGPT <clears throat> in uh, late 2022, we also looked into uh, using LLMs, large language models, in order to support the detection of malicious packages in and or labs um, malware detection pipelines. And so we were motivated um, by very nice and uh, encouraging examples like what you see here. Um, so this is an NPM, um, again, a real world example from N NPM in this case, uh, where in line four, you see that curl is used in order to download a Windows executable. And then in line five, no, in fact, this is just the command. The command execution happens a little bit below. And then uh, this downloaded Windows executable is executed using the start command. And so if you uh, submit this uh, snippet to the different, um, to different LLM models, we asked it to rate the maliciousness of this code snippet on a scale from zero to nine. And um, as I said, very encouraging. The results were very encouraging. GPT 3.5 um, responded with a seven on this scale from zero to nine. Text Bison with also seven and GPT 4 with a, with a risk rating of eight. All of that basically motivated us to include an additional step in our pipeline and for every suspicious code snippet that we came across, uh, we submitted this to a large language model in order to get a secondary opinion. And that's why we called it LLM assisted malware reviews. So we started off very optimistic and um, uh, with a hope to reduce our review effort, right? Um, and uh, we, we did this uh, testing two of those LLMs in parallel, we used the GPT 3.45 and uh, text Bison. We um, excluded uh, GPT 4 due to the slow response times, not to speak of the costs. And uh, the results um, are visible here in this bar chart. So for more than 3000 assessments, we found that both of these models agree very much on the maliciousness on this scale from zero to nine. So in this bar chart, you see that in 1,429 cases, both GPT uh, 3.5 and text Bison agreed on the very same risk rating. And on the very right, 
you see that in only 16 cases, they, there was a huge difference between the rating of those two LLMs. And so in the next step, um, so that while there is a, a big agreement, they also agree on false positives. So in the next step of this evaluation, we basically uh, manually went through all the cases uh, where either the risk rating was a, above four, so in the upper 50% of the risk scale, or where the difference was bigger than four. And what you see on the right-hand side are basically the confusion matrices for both of the LLM models for around about 170 or 180 cases. And what you see here is that there's still, both of the models in fact have a very high number of false positives. And this is, I think, in line with what Rob mentioned earlier on, um, where, where they, and so you can see that they succeed at times to identify a snippet as a true positive. So this is the lower right corner of the confusion matrices. But in many, many cases, they actually got it wrong and wrongly marked something as malicious, even though that was not actually the case. And the reasons, so both have low precision. And the reasons are many of those false positives were in fact caused by either packed or minified JavaScript code, which is still a common practice in NPM package. What it basically means is that a third party or open source dependency dependency in short, is just uh, yeah, minified, uh, which means that white spaces are removed. Um, the variable names and other identifiers can be shortened in order to reduce the space. And you basically have a complete dependency in one single source code line. And this is or has been um, assessed as being an obfuscation technique, which apparently made both of these model conclude that this is malicious. So this is explaining a good number of those false positives. And another source of um, false positives were hallucinations about incomplete code snippets, because um, you can obviously not submit the whole open source packages for assessment to these large language models, but you need to um, shrink it because of the token limitations or you need to select a snippet basically. So what we did is we took as much context as possible from a suspicious looking piece of source code, submitted this. But very often we didn't, we were not able to extract the whole file. And then uh, in several occasions we found that um, the models were hallucinating about the maliciousness of code that they couldn't see, which we couldn't uh, submit due to the token length. And um, yeah, and then the third reason was that, uh, and I think this is something that I mentioned uh, already in the beginning, in some cases, there are suspicious techniques also used for legitimate reasons. For example, you have, you download something from a remote server and save this locally, locally in your file system. That can be used for uh, legitimate reasons, but this is also often used by malicious um, packages in order to download second stage payload, which is then executed at a later point in time. Having talked, so these were basically our experiments and some lessons learned when using LLMs for malware detection. And uh, the other experiments we, we continued thereafter relate to misuse cases. And basically since the beginning, shortly after um, OpenAI released and published ChatGPT, there were researchers investigating the possibility to misuse these LLMs. So uh, very early, there were some early reports on how you could use LLMs to run and conduct spear phishing campaigns uh, to gener generate malicious code. Uh, there are warm GPT and fraud GPT, which are fine-tuned uh, large language models in order to perform yeah, malicious, various malicious activities. Again, code generation being one of them. And those fine-tuned models, of course, do not have the same guardrails as have the commercial alternatives or variants. And um, 
according or let's say along those lines, we um, conducted one experiment which is confirming somehow the possibility and the danger of LLMs being available to attackers. And what we did is we basically tried to understand whether it is possible to uh, take malicious snippets as the one that you have seen in the a few slides back in order to create mutations or variants that adapt to a target package that could be a possible target of an injection attack. So um, as you see here on the, on the picture, uh, we basically have um, three inputs that we hand over to GPT-4 in this example. We have a malicious snippet in the middle as, uh, and as, uh, for the experiments, we used exactly the one that you have seen. We have a description of a target file. So this is basically a textual description of a package and a file into which an attacker could inject malicious code. Um, this could be written manually, but it could also be extracted automatically using um, these co code comprehension capabilities of LLMs. And then we have, as always, a couple of instructions explaining the LLM what to do. And the result of that would be, in fact, a mutated malware. And this is a, a simple example. Um, what we did here is we took those three lines I've shown earlier on and uh, we extracted context from Pillow, which is a pretty well-known IPI package for image manipulation. And in more detail, we looked at, we took one of the files, which is called Spider Image Plugin, a plugin for working with this, with this particular image format. And we asked GPT to, in fact, alter the malicious snippet and hide it in this other file such that it would be harder that such that the original functionality is maintained. So it is still operational, but that it is um, basically harder to detect. And uh, we suggested also different techniques that could be used by, by GPT-4 in order to reach this goal. And what you see on the lower right-hand side is in fact the result, what was returned. Uh, and you see that those three lines have actually been split into different functions. You also see that all these identifiers have been uh, adapted to the language and the terminology of the target package and the target file. And GPT also was able to came up with pretty convincing unobtrusive um, comments, which altogether make it more difficult for manual reviewers. So if you look at this, um, the number of indirections uh, make it harder to understand the control flow. Um, and uh, apart from manual analysis, it also turned out to fool the very simple uh, pattern-based uh, detection rules. For example, the one that I've uh, shown in the beginning. The reason here was that these interprocedural data flows, which are now uh, yeah, spread to three or two different functions cannot be detected any longer. And we also saw a down um, kind of, uh, we also saw that uh, the, the risk rating by GPT 3.5 went down. So from on a scale this time from uh, zero to 100, the initial rating of the, the snippet on the top was 80 and it uh, went down to 40 after the manipulation. The good news is that um, GPT, in fact, was uh, resistant and uh, basically to this change, and it was still able and came up still with the same risk rating, which um, I find very notable. And uh, I will have actually code snippets of or screenshots of the, the responses. So here again, GPT 3.5, where you see the original rating of, um, of the snippet um, was judged as 80 or risk score of 80. And it clearly highlighted that this snippet is highly suspicious and potentially malicious. And the mutated snippet that we handed over, which was transformed, um, apparently picks up the language and the terminology from Pillow and uh, the spider image plugin. And so 
it understands it is related to this image processing. However, it's still, and um, the response continues below uh, the screenshot, it still raised several concerns which were related to downloading things and executing. But overall, the risk score went significantly down. GPT-4, however, as I said, kept this risk score of 90, so pretty high. Um, and what I find, um, I think, most surprising is that it was somehow able to, to understand, in quotes, uh, I have to add the same quotes that Rob added a couple of times, um, it was kind of under, uh, able to understand the control flow in happening um, from, from the different functions calling each other, right? Uh, able to understand that even though it was split across functions, there was something downloaded that was then executed in a different function. So my conclusions for those experiments um, and also some general takeaways. So name and dependency confusion attacks are by far the most prominent category of supply chain attacks happening these days. And what is very good is that those are detected more and more quickly. So in the very beginning, um, when uh, I started uh, looking at malicious packages, they stayed for weeks and sometimes sometimes months. But nowadays, uh, the dwell time for malicious packages is much shorter. Sometimes they stay only up for a few hours. And in general, the download numbers are very, very small. So the impact is relatively little. When it comes to LLM-based detection, we found that several problems result in a lot of false positives. And so we don't and cannot use LLMs for automated malware detection. We rather use this for additional secondary opinions, kind of as an advisor on top of uh, helping manual reviewers, basically. We also see that attackers actively misuse large language models. So um, there were a couple of um, cases where uh, malicious packages or code of malicious packages have, have um, has obviously been generated by GPTs. And the researchers do, who did this work uh, were basically able to show and regenerate and create the same prompt that resulted in the code that was corresponding to what they have found in the malicious packages. And last, for our own experiments, um, they can use this to uh, basically create variations. For the defenders point, from the defender's point of view, uh, we can use those large language models to generate variants in order to evaluate the quality of our detection pipelines and our tooling. And last but not least, I would like to refer to different resources uh, in regards to uh, supply chain attacks. The first one is this uh, supply chain risk explorer. So this is, I've mentioned this earlier on, this taxonomy of a text, something um, that I've been built with colleagues uh, at SAP Security Research. So it's a comprehensive economic ecosystem agnostic taxonomy of attack vectors with examples, controls, and various references. The second one is this Backstabber's Knife Collection, where which is, a, um, to my knowledge, the biggest data set of malicious packages, which helps researchers to uh, analyze malware and develop um, detection mechanisms. And the last one I'd like to uh, mention here is the uh, Package Analysis Project from OpenSSF. Um, they uh, implemented dynamic detection. They also have static detection, but I think dynamic detection is the more successful part of what, of what they have developed. And they succeed indeed to automatically detect a large number of malicious packages, and they automatically report them to the open source vulnerability database, all of which is contributing to the reduced dwell times of malicious packages on registries like NPM. PyPI. And that is basically concluding my talk. 